Hello everyone. In this video I would like to talk about the neuroordinary differential equations and specifically what we need to consider when we want to learn a node model of a physical system when the input data is sampled data at distinct time steps. So that is a typical problem in data-driven engineering for real-world systems that due to sensors and due to the computational processing of the sensor data we normally only have data inputs at distinct sampling time steps. And that might be a certain challenge which we will uh, address today because in the node context of course what we actually do is we represent our model, our data-driven modeling approach via a continuous function, the right hand side, and for that we also need a continuous input u of t. And the idea uh, we are going to present today and we'll discuss today is that we are trying to interpolate or approximate these data points by an, a function which uh, is yeah, an interpolation or approximation candidate of our ground truth data. So basically something like this. And by doing that uh, we have the opportunity to also have input information or interpolated input information in between the data points where we do not have any distinct um, measurement. The advantage of this is that we might be able to process uh, the node computationally quicker and the another advantage might be also that if in the input data there might be some measurement noise uh, on u of t that with this interpolation theoretically we can also reduce uh, the input uh, noise amount. And in order to um, visualize, in order to discuss this interpolation or approximation approach of the sampled input data, we are going to actually use real-world, real measured data from a classical uh, mechatronic system, the so-called ball and beam problem, which I've sketched down here. So um, the idea is quite simple. We have a beam which angle is basically um, modifiable, manipulatable via this lever arm which is mounted here like on a rotating gear. So we can basically um, move up this lever arm um, up and down such that this angle alpha of t can be manipulated. And what we're going to observe is a ball um, which is on this beam, so which is basically um, yeah, rolling around on the beam and our input data is therefore this alpha t, so the angle of the beam which is manipulated by this lever arm and the output data, so that is u of t, and the output data is the position r of t, so the displacement of the ball along the length of this beam arm. Okay, and our task in this video is basically that we are utilizing the input data u of t, so the angle of the beam, and we want to make a prediction on y of t, so on how the ball is basically moving around on this beam. Okay, so let's go into the details um, using this notebook. So here's a little sketch uh, of the same system. Um, which we can see down here. And in order to uh, work with real-world data, we will make use out of a um, data-driven system identification databases, the so-called DAISY uh, database for identification of systems, where we have a short episode of a ball and beam experiment, which you can basically download. And that is done here in this function, load download or load data, where we basically download the data and in the data we will basically just find two information. The information on uh, u of t is basically here in this first element of data and y of t, so the output, the position of uh, the ball is in the second argument which is therefore our y of t. Sample time is 0.1 seconds and we have in, to in total 1000 data points, so basically data from an experiment out of 100 seconds of experimenting with this ball and beam. Optionally, we also have here a normalization or standardization to be more precise in the data 
uh, which we will make use of in the following. Okay, uh, with this loading, uh, we can then basically also just quickly uh, plot the data which we have uh, downloaded so far. Uh, green is the uh, input data, so our angle in radians. So we can also see here that this angle is not like really displaced so much. So actually this alpha here is uh, a small wiggling around the uh, horizontal line. And uh, Y uh, of T is the orange uh, line. So basically the, the displacement of the ball around the beam, which can be in between minus 15 centimeters plus 15 centimeters. Okay. And our task is now to utilize the greenish input in order to predict the orange output of the system. And as in our previous videos, we will make use of the neural ODE approach. Okay, but first we need to consider that although this figure looks like continuous, of course our inputs and outputs are just sampled um, values at a time step of 0.1 seconds and we need first a continuous representation of u of t. We do this um, via the so-called data interpolations functions, which is a package in Julia which offers us different interpolation and approximation techniques. And in this first approach, we are making use of the Akima interpolation, which is one out of many interpolation possibilities which we have there. With this interpolation of the data points, um, here looking at the first snippet out of the first five seconds, which is basically the first 50 data points, we can see that the Akima interpolation works very well. We have here the um, light green, light blue data points, which are only uh, available every 0.1 second. And then the um, orange curve is the interpolated function, which is now a function saved in this interp input function, which we can represent as a continuous function of the input data. And uh, that is nice because we can put that into the um, node representation and we will also see another uh, interesting advantage of this continuous representation of the input data in one of the following approaches. Okay, so we have now the continuous input data, but we do not have any idea about the physics of the system. So as a first starting point, a naive starting point, what we do is we form again a neural ODE with a black box right hand side. And in order to do that, uh, we can have a look at this um, cell here. So what we can basically see is that we have again a multi-layer perceptron with no hidden layer, just an input and an output layer. And we have um, two inputs, which is basically X, uh, so our state itself, and the interp input of t, so this continuous function representing our data points u of t. And x of t, so our state itself, as we only have one output in our a and n representing the right hand side, basically means that this state is just the um, position r of t itself, right? So the right hand side is therefore a function of r of t and u of t, and the output of, of that is the uh, single state first order representation of R of T. Okay, so simple uh, node representation and uh, we also make use of the standardization as we have seen before in the one of the previous videos and also with the TAN H we also normalize or um, ensure that the numerics of the ODE solver are somehow fine because the values are limited due to the TAN H activation function. Okay, with that we can uh, do the normal stuff. So we do a predict uh, command, we do a loss command, which is basically just the uh, squared loss again. And we formulate an optimization function um, as usual. And we basically go through the um, uh, optimization here uh, itself. And what we can basically see from that is that the optimization was successful, so we do not get any numerical issues. Uh, we can also see that the BFG solver was done after 29 seconds and 40 iterations, so that's so far fine. Also our convergence measures are fine, so we are definitely sure that we have found a good local optimum giving the initial uh, initialization of the ANN. However, if we 
inspect the model output. So the model output is now y of t hat, so this is the, the orange one, and the ground truth data, which is um, the greenish one here, we can basically see that this really does not work together. And the issue for that is that our right-hand side of this ball and beam problem is just too less expressive. So we did not really model with this first order right-hand side where f uh, hat is basically just a scalar function depending on y of t or x of t and u of t is not enough. And uh, we therefore are not able to represent this wiggling behavior of the ball on the beam. So what we do in order to get better is, of course, we need to incorporate some a priori knowledge. We need to get some expert knowledge about the physics of the system. And what we can do by that is we can either study Newton's mechanics or we can just take a lecture book of our choice. And what we will actually find out um, on this is that the second derivative, so air dot dot, so the acceleration of this ball on the beam using Newton mechanics uh, is depending, of course, on the gravity uh, and on alpha and on the inertia, on the radius and on the mass of this ball. However, what we can see from this ODE is that this is a second order ODE. So with our first order ODE in the first attempt, we definitely had one order too few in terms of states. So what we therefore do as a next step is we will extend our node approach by a second order ODE. And because the, um, the second order ODE with just the air dot dot can be of course rewritten in the state space form. And what we can see from that is that we get an intro integrator behavior between air dot and air. And what we can basically now do is we can take again our inputs alpha of t uh, and with alpha of t, we can try to estimate the speed r dot of t, and then the speed r dot of t is integrated towards the actual position of r of t, right? So we will extend our node by another state, right? So here we can see that in the node notation, so we assume this integral behavior between r dot of t and r of t, and our node is basically now limited to a function representing f hat, which will represent the right-hand side only of the speed of the ball, right? R dot of t is the speed of the ball, which is now represented by our right-hand side. So what we do is we incorporate additional structural knowledge, pre-knowledge about the system. So we therefore need to restructure our A and N. Um, what we basically can see here is that we again have just a simple A and N straightforward. And the big difference is now here that the A and N uh, right-hand side is represented by X2. So this is this air dot. That is our first part of the right-hand side. And then the second part of the right-hand side representing our second state derivative is then this R and N, which only depends on the input now, right? Interp input. So this is exactly this part of our uh, node approach. With this, we go again through our uh, modeling and optimization problem. We can see that the optimization approach was terminating successfully. And if we have a look at our representation of the found model, we can still see that that was not so successful. We see, okay, it's somehow, you know, taking the general, let's say, trend without these fast transient dynamics is just like the slow transient dynamics which are modeled by that. But obviously these fast changes of the ball position are not covered by the second order uh, node approach. Therefore, uh, we need to study our lecture books a little bit harder. And what we actually will find out is that the Newton's approach is not sufficient, but we need to apply the so-called Lagrangian approach, and in the Lagrangian approach we will actually see that the speed derivative of the uh, ball is not only depending on, the, uh, on alpha, but it's also depending on alpha dot, so how fast I'm changing the uh, lever angle, and also on air dot itself, 
uh, due to friction, right? So if this ball is moving fast, of course, there might be some certain friction in terms of drag or also friction against the surface, which will basically uh, have an impact on the acceleration of the ball itself. So what we do now is we again extend our node representation, not in terms of states, we still have just two states, but we repre represent the A and N as being dependent on alpha, alpha dot, and uh, air. So air, of course, is part of the ODE solver output. Alpha of t has been incorporated by this interpolation function. The problem is now that uh, alpha dot of t is something which we do not have, right? Because we only have the sample data points, but we do not have any information about the derivative of alpha over time. And the nice thing is, if we represent these data points by a continuous function which is differentiable, which uh, is actually the case in the example which we are using here, then we can just differentiate the interpolated function in order to get alpha dot. We can see that here with the derivative function. So what we do is we utilize the data interpolation data interpolations package dot derivative of our interpolation function and what we get are the derivatives alpha dot of t which are somehow nice, okay, we see there is maybe a little bit of let's say spikes of course in the derivatives due to the fitting of noise or due to the interpolation of noise but generally the uh, derivatives here uh, of the input angle are quite fine. So with this new concept we then start again. Um, what are the differences now? Basically just again our representation of our right hand side of the ODE. So x dot again is this integral behavior and the a and n is now depending on x itself, so on the full state, so on air and air dot, the interp input, so on alpha, and data interpolations derivative, so on alpha dot, right? So still just a second order system, but with more inputs to the right hand side of f hat. With this representation, we then go again in the optimization loop. Eventually also this um, converges into a local optima after roughly two minutes of optimization time. And if we compare the model output now against the ground truth data, we can see that this ex extended model input behavior has now helped in order to also model some of these fast transient dynamics. And the model fit is not ideal for obvious reasons, but I would say it's okay-ish, it's going into the right direction. So what are the key takeaway messages from this example? We have seen again that the node approach itself is not a one-fits-all solution, but we need to configure the right-hand side of our node approach such that it really fits our application. And we did that here by structurally incorporating more states due to the physical um, relations between the ball position and its derivative and alpha and its derivative. But we also basically did a physics-inspired feature engineering in terms of the inputs to this right-hand side such that we can represent the dynamics more accurately. We will leave it basically here, um, although of course we could Im improve that by uh, trying to incorporate more physics data um, driven features or we could do some hyperparameter optimization on the ANN itself and so on and so on. However, we are already um, in a good starting position now in order to fine tune the model and so on. I thank you for watching this video and then see you in the next videos on nodes where we will also have a look into the different flavors of how we can incorporate uh, artificial neural networks on the right hand side of a nonlinear dynamic system in order to get a sweet spot between data driven knowledge, so the node approach and expert pre-knowledge in order to get physically interpretable systems with high accuracy. Thank you and see you then.